Computer, initialize Holosuite. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the Sci-Fi Feminist Podcast. Before I get into today's topic, which is what I believe to be one of the greatest marvels of the 21st century, Red Dead Redemption 2, I would first just like to say uh, thank you for supporting the podcast up to now. And just a reminder that there's a Sci-Fi Feminist YouTube channel where I also post some extra content once a week. And I'm also on Patreon. So if you would like to receive a shout out on the show or other perks, then um, please head over there to my Patreon page and um, support the podcast if you would like to. You can also find the Patreon link on YouTube if you go there. Right, so let me get right into today's episode. Today I'm doing something a little bit different. Today I'm going to talk about one of or I think the best video game that I have ever played in my entire life and I have played quite a few which is of course Red Dead Redemption 2. What I like so much about the game is not the graphics or obviously that is really great there's nothing better than getting on my horse after a long day of work and then just riding into the sunset in the game and the soundtrack and the characters and all of that but while I was playing the game, I'm about, I think, 60 or 70% done with the game now, after about a year. So it's, uh, as you know, quite a big game. But as I was playing the game, I came across a few very interesting missions. And in these missions, I saw that the game presents a sort of a critique on various issues specifically environmental issues and there's one or two missions that also talks about women's issues so i thought let me do a podcast episode about that today since it is such a great game and such a wonderful topic and um, i will talk about five missions and discuss a little bit about how that comments on current environmental and women's issues what I found so interesting is that we have this video game that's obviously made in the 21st century, but it plays off at the time of the Cowboys, which I believe is the 1800s in America. So this game is quite accurate, I've heard, in terms of representing what America looked like at that time. The other day I was driving with my sister in where was it uh it was some desolate place in south africa where i stay and um there were these mountains and like um what's the word like cactus type plants so i told her wow it feels like i'm in red dead redemption too <laughs> they really made the scenery so great and um, i think it is a very accurate representation of 19th century late 18th century america so but that <laughs> besides that point what is so interesting is that the game that was created recently through using certain events that took place during that time it makes comments on contemporary issues which i thought was very clever and that's why i think that the game is beyond just being graphics and good stories and good characters but what makes this game even greater is that it presents this implicit critique now this critique is not very explicit it's not in your face but it's very subtle which is also something that I really enjoyed. So without further ado then, let me go to the first mission that I found was very interesting in terms of environmental critique. So in this mission, it is a side mission, and I think it's just called Hunting a Bison with Charles. <laughs> That's what it says on the wiki, so I obviously can't remember all of the mission titles, but Basically what happens in this mission is that you go with one of the other members of the camp. I think he might be a Native American, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, don't quote me on that. But basically you go with him and you go and hunt a bison, which is this really huge animal. It's like a, 
I'm not sure exactly what a bison is. It's like a big ox thing. Um, but it's this huge animal. And actually in the game, it took me a few arrows to kill it. <laughs> Obviously, I didn't kill it one shot. But I'm also a terrible shot. So <laughs> it could be that. I'm not sure if you're actually supposed to kill it with one arrow in the game. I'm not sure. But anyway, you go and hunt for this animal with Charles, one of the characters in the game. And then what happens is you find your bison and you hunt it. And he keeps telling you in the game that we hunt the bison and we use everything of the animal to the best of our ability. So they use the skin, they use the meat, they use the hooves, they use every part in his culture. So as not to waste the animal. So it's not killing out of killing for the fun of it or hunting just for the fun of hunting, but they hunt the bison uh, in a, we would say, kind of a respectful way. And obviously that's debatable, but I think the way the game approaches this mission really comments on where do we draw the line between hunting for fun and poaching and hunting because we need the things from the animals. So I'm not even going to go into... <laughs> Uh, vegetarianism and you know current politics of this because I'm not an authority on that I, I don't know much about it so I'm not going to talk about that but in this mission we can see they make a clear distinction between a poacher and between someone that hunts the animal out of uh, in a respectful way so you hunt the animal and then I remember in the mission, he tells you, don't leave anything. So Arthur actually skins the animal and you take the meat to the chef and you kind of use all the parts of the animal. And then they keep riding along the way and then they start finding these dead bison lying around. So they go on a sort of a, uh, they track down the killers then of these dead bison and what happens here is um, they find uh, a dead one first and then they realize, oh, it's quite fresh and none of the parts of the bison are actually used. Um, they're kind of just lie lying there in the field to die. Like they were hunted and shot and just left there. So the meat and the fur and nothing is used. So that leads Charles to to deduct that, oh, maybe something is wrong here. <laughs> why are why is this bison just lying here dead and it's not being used? Then you go a bit more and then you find another one. And I think you find about three or four bison until you eventually track down the killers. And then actually, Charles and Arthur, you have the option then to, I think it's about three men that you find. And they kind of interrogate them and they're like, what the heck are you doing? Why, why are these bison, what's happening? And it turns out that they are actually poachers. So what makes them different from Charles and Arthur is that these poachers don't use the skin from the bison and the meat and everything, but they just kill them for the sake of killing them for fun. And so then Arthur, you can choose between killing the hunter or uh, saving saving his life. I think I let him go because I'm a real goody two shoes. And every time my honor meter goes down, I'm like, oh, no, I didn't mean to do something bad. So I always choose the more merciful option. So I think I didn't kill him when I did the mission. But here a clear distinction is made. And I thought that's very apt commentary because... Obviously, poaching is such a relevant issue in the 21st century too. Poaching rhinos, especially in South Africa, I'm quite aware of that because there's always news about rhinos getting poached and elephants getting poached for their tusks and their horns and being sold on the black market. And we hear all these horror stories to the point where now they actually remove the rhino's horns as a precaution so that they can't get poached for their horns. So this mission, yes, <laughs> there's not much to it, but I found this commentary very relevant to the 21st century. And it's really beautiful how they use these bison as a very clear way to illustrate that, you know, there's a difference between killing the animal for using it for what you need and respecting the animal and respecting the bison 
and people just killing them for fun and for the sake of killing it and not even using any of the parts of the bison. Yes, so that was the first mission that I found a very interesting critique on uh, current issues. Right, so then the second one is a mission called Arcadia for Amateurs. And basically, this is really fun. <laughs> there is this photographer. His name is Albert Mason. And throughout the game, you encounter him. And he's basically a wildlife photographer in the 19th century. So he has this really old camera. And every now and then you run into him, or obviously he appears on the, on the map, and then you can go to him and you can do a mission with him. So usually the missions require uh, something regarding the animals. So I think the first mission, the first time we encounter him, he's trying to get a picture of the wolves or the coyotes, or it's not the coyotes. I think it's the wolves. And then, um, yeah, you need to chase the coyote because it chases, it, it grabs his bag of meat. So you need to get it for him. But it's these really like random and what seem like random encounters with this photographer, obviously. And there's no real reward to the missions, which I found quite interesting too. I, I did the mission and there's nothing. And I'm like, Oh, okay. I think maybe that's what makes this game so unique because in video games, we're so used to chasing a reward. You know, I do a mission and I get a reward. But here the reward is simply helping this guy. And eventually he gives you like a little photograph of the coyote or the wolves that he took a picture of. So you get these very small things, not really things that will aid you in any way in the game, but these quite sentimental kind of artifacts that he gives you. And of course, you get to do a really fun mission <laughs> with the animals. So yeah, there's this guy, Albert Mason, and he's taking pictures of wildlife. So there are a few times when we encounter him. Uh, like I said, the first time he's trying to take pictures of uh, wolves. So you kind of help him uh, fend off the wolves. And then later there is another one where I think he's trying to get a picture of horses. So I really enjoyed this mission actually. So you have to chase the horses into his direction so that he can get like a beautiful shot of the wild horses. So I, yeah, it's really fun. Again, I think, yeah, and this, at the end of this mission that you get the photograph of the wolves, <laughs> uh, as a thanks for helping him. And then later there is a mission where you want, you need to help him get a picture of a crocodile. So he's actually trying to, there's apparently this huge gator and there are these swamp areas in the game. Uh, of course they were beautifully animated and beautifully done. And, uh, you know, when I was rowing my boat on the swamp and I feel like I really was in the swamp, <laughs> the game is just so beautifully done, but that's besides the point. What happens in this, this mission is, yes, like I said, he's trying to take a picture of uh, an alligator. So you row the boat and then he is sitting on the, on the front of the boat with his camera and you need to help him get a picture. And at one point the alligator is a bit far. So he's like, can you run over there and, um, you know, kind of bring the alligator this way? And Arthur actually does it. And, uh, yeah, I would not do that. But anyway, <laughs> but as you are rowing and talking to him, if you listen to their conversation, I think that's another feature of the game that makes it so unique and wonderful is the conversations that the characters have while they are traveling. It really reveals a lot about them. And in this case, again, we see this very subtle critique of hunting animals and destroying them because we don't know about them. So I really felt that this mission was really commenting on the conservation of nature. So Albert Mason, basically, they start talking and Arthur being the rugged wild cowboy that he is, he's like, yeah, I don't even know why you want to get close to these gators. They are so dangerous and they're just going to eat your leg off and they're just going to kill you. And then Albert Mason is like, they keep, they keep hunting the alligators, but you know, the swamp belongs to the alligators. They belong here. We're kind of imposing on their territory and people hunt them because they are scared of them. 
but they don't um they don't realize how majestic and how amazing and how tremendous these creatures really are and i think at some point he also goes into that whole thing of alligators being like um dinosaurs <laughs> i i think they are from the dinosaur area again don't quote me on this i am by no means an aficionado on animals <laughs> i really only talk about women and feminism but Albert Mason really makes a very clear, he makes very clear his standpoint on killing these alligators. And, you know, his mission as a wildlife photographer is he wants to take pictures of them to kind of show how, how amazing these creatures are and that we shouldn't be killing them. I think that is really the point of this mission is he's trying to get a photograph to show the locals that, you know, this is a really great majestic creature and they are not to be killed. They, they belong here and we are imposing on them. So yes, in terms of the wildlife photography mission, then that is the second very interesting critique that we see on um, on the environment and on nature. And again, it's very relevant to the 21st century too. You know, people still, well, more than ever, we are imposing on nature and people still kind of kill animals because they just don't understand them. And, you know, they were here first. <laughs> we, we can't, um, yeah, we can't kill them because we are going into their territory. Maybe this might be some controversial views, I'm not sure. Like I said, once again, these are just things I picked up in the game. Uh, don't quote me on any of this, but it's just what I picked up in the game. And then you might be curious to know how this story ends with Albert Mason. Eventually, you help him to take a picture of some eagles, and then he falls off the cliff, <laughs> and then you help him back up. And after that, he decides to... Uh, uh, that he had enough of wildlife photography. And again, he doesn't give you anything. <laughs> so I think the only thing you really gain from doing these four missions for him is the picture of the wolves, which I think is quite precious in, in its own way. So yes, that is the second one. So then let me go on to the third one. And this mission happens in a very, um, yeah, I got totally immersed in this part of the game. I remember that night I was quite tired after a long week. So I thought I'm just going to play maybe an hour or two of Red Dead Redemption and um, just to wind down, just get on my horse and ride around a bit. But then at the end of the day, basically, I, I ended up spending, I think, four or five hours, uh, which I felt quite bad about because I don't want to spend that much time on video games because I don't have that much time but it just totally immersed me so this is the mission where they kind of escape from again this robbery that went wrong what I find so funny about these guys is everywhere they go they just make a complete mess and then they go somewhere else and then the mess gets bigger and bigger and bigger and I think it got, yeah, by this mission, it gets to the point where they have no no choice but to actually just get on a ship and run away. So what happens is the ship crashes in the ocean and then they kind of wash up on this island. The island, now I forgot the name of the island. Right, I found it. The island's name is Guarma. So they wash up on this island called Guarma. Not very, I guess, not very far from America. And in this island, we see the kind of reality of sugar farming. So it's kind of implied earlier in the game that, and I think this was a very big thing in America at that time, is sugarcane farming. And if I've got my history correct, they used to actually get slaves from Africa as cheap labor to use in the sugarcane farms in America. Again, don't quote me on that, but from high school history, that is what I remember. So when we see this island, Guarma, this is like a sugar farming island. And on the island, we really see this exploitation take place. We see that there is some company and they their only their only purpose is profit of course so 
Arthur gets sucked up into this whole thing where he ends up helping some of the slaves and some of the people that actually work on these this island as sugarcane farmers. And again, what is quite interesting is that the viewpoint we see here is that we feel sympathy for them. They show how they are mistreated, how they are exploited, and Arthur kind of joins a sort of a rebellion where he helps these people and um, in order to get off the island and get onto a ship. There's another interesting part in this mission too, is where Arthur and Dutch go through these caves with an older woman. And I think at this point in the game, Arthur starts to feel a little bit disillusioned with Dutch because... I mean, they just stranded on an island after Dutch said we need to do this final robbery. So I think he's a little bit concerned with Dutch. And at some point, because obviously this game is a very violent game, Arthur kills a lot of people and there's many shootouts and things. But at some point in this game, Dutch kills an older woman for no particular reason. And at that time, Arthur is like, oh, man, that was not cool. Why did you just kill her for no particular reason? And I found that very interesting, too, because throughout the game, we see them kill indiscriminately. And the game is quite free, too. So if you're willing to let your honor drop to a very low point, which I was not willing to do, you can really go around and kill whoever you want and just do whatever you want. And... um but the tone in in this particular mission is quite different because Arthur actually, again, draws a line between when is it okay to kill and when is it not okay to kill. If you're just killing for the sake of killing that old woman that was helping them and then stealing the gold that they paid her to help them, then somehow that is wrong. But killing a bunch of other people in a shootout and various other dodgy missions that are very gray, <laughs> there's lots of gray areas in the missions, that is somehow okay and not questioned. And once again, you know, I, may, I might say that, but Arthur is also uh, quite a troubled man, <laughs> we realize throughout the game. And he also has many regrets. So what I like about this game too is that although, you know, it is a very violent game, its approach to violence is a little bit more self-reflective. It kind of reflects on when is it okay to be violent <laughs> or when is violence okay and when is it not? Obviously, I think it's never okay <laughs> and I still find it so problematic that in video games, heroism is framed in terms of violence. As you all know, I'm a very big fan of Laura Croft, but you know, at the end of the day, she's actually a murderer. She kills innocent, well, maybe not innocent people. They are, they are framed as the enemy in terms of Laura, in Laura's perspective. But you know, who's to say she's the good guy? Um, there's lots of gray areas. <laughs> she kills the enemy, which is Trinity, but you know, the soldiers for Trinity, who's to say that they're not good people that have families and kids, you know, the uh, violence in video games, it's a very, obviously, uh, well documented and debated topic. But, you know, where Tomb Raider approaches violence very unproblematically, like, oh, Laura's the good guy, whoever she kills is okay, because she's morally superior. In Red Dead Redemption 2, we see that, oh, no, you know, uh, maybe violence should be questioned. Obviously, these cowboys aren't morally that great either. They are kind of framed as these uh, really rebellious and um, yeah, morally questionable kind of characters. And even Arthur too, uh, as a character, he's deeply flawed, but also deeply uh, hurt and damaged and all these types of things. And... Um, yeah, I just found that moment when Dutch kills the woman and Arthur just draws the line and he's like, no, um, this is not okay. I found that very fascinating. I have yet to see a game that is self-reflective on itself and self-reflexive on violence, especially as Red Dead Redemption 2 is. So 
Yes, and then of course, like I said, uh, we see the other side of sugarcane farming, and you know, upon the capitalism that America is built, I think as a whole, this game is quite an interesting commentary on capitalism too. They went to great lengths to to really, how can I say, the brand names of the things that also uses, like the tobacco and the tonics and the drinks and the cigarettes. They're all brand named. And I think that those little details too, I think that, of course, it makes the game more realistic. But that in conjunction with this sugarcane farming mission, I think it's a very implicit and subtle commentary on capitalism, consumerism, and the foundation on which American society was built, <laughs> which is basically the exploitation of slaves and um, the, the foundation of consumerist society, which is exploitation at the end of the day. So, of course, <laughs> uh, South Africa has a similar history, so... Once again, I, I don't want to go into that, but just interesting to point out the, the the commentary that the game makes on these types of issues. Right, and then let's move on to women then. So in this game, it's very interesting, of course, for women's issues, because that's always what I look at. And in this game, I did, really did not expect to find anything regarding feminism or comments on feminism or comments on women or anything like that. Usually, from my experience, these types of games, like The Witcher, for example, obviously they're not exactly the same, uh, but maybe let me not compare it to The Witcher, maybe let me compare it to Grand Theft Auto. The way that women are treated in Grand Theft Auto is very matter of fact, you know, women are prostitutes, they are girlfriends, there, there's really not much. There's not any significant female characters in Grand Theft Auto. It's a very much, this is what it is. And of course, that's what Grand Theft Auto is. I think it doesn't only rely on gender stereotypes, but lots of racial stereotypes too. Grand Theft Auto is in itself very problematic. But I also think that it's kind of problematic on purpose so it might be a comment on these types of things too but maybe I'll do a, another episode of Grand Theft Auto later so not to go into that but from this type of game I didn't expect anything regarding women's issues and then this really interesting character named Sadie gets into the picture and at the beginning of the game she's really kind of on the sidelines you see her a little bit here and there I think at some point she asks you to find her harmonica, which I still haven't done. I still need to find it for her. But at th some point there is a mission. It's called Further Questions of Female Suffrage. Now, a little bit of background, a little bit of history. During the late 19th, 19th century, so that would be late 1800s, I always get confused, and early 20th century, so the early 1900s, that was basically the beginning for second wave femin, ah, uh, not sorry, se not second wave feminism, first wave feminism. Yeah, I haven't talked about first wave feminism in such a long time. I automatically say second wave feminism, but that was the first wave of the feminist movement. And it was called the, the women's suffrage, basically. And I think that's a French term, if I'm not mistaken. I think actually the first wave originated in Europe. It was more a European thing for women to have rights in when it comes to voting. And then they also fought for a few other things like women to have custody over their children. So during that time, actually, if you were married and your husband cheated on you and he was at fault and he divorces you, you can't get custody of your children because you're a woman. He automatically automatically got custody. So these types of issues were addressed in the women's suffrage in that movement. And then if you've watched the movie Suffragette, you know that what happened is one of the women in the suffrage, she got run over by a horse and she died. And at that time, actually, 
they they became uh, more visible and at that time these types of issues started getting resolved to the point where now in America, Europe and even South Africa, women have the right to vote. Obviously not in all countries of the world, as you know, but in most Western nations, women have the right to vote. So that is thanks to the women's suffrage, to the first wave of feminists. Uh, maybe if you would like to learn more about that and you're not into reading like I am, then you can watch the movie. It's called Suffragette. It has a few of my favorite actresses, including Meryl Streep, all hail Meryl, <laughs> and Helena Bonham Carter in the movie. Uh, so you can watch that movie if you want to know more about that topic. But interestingly, Red Dead Redemption, it includes issues of women's suffrage. <laughs> and once again, we see how this game that takes part in the late 1800s and early 1900s actually comments on contemporary feminist issues. I think it does so implicitly and explicitly. Implicitly because there is actually a female heroine in the game and one that in my view is actually quite progressive and her name is Sadie. Even though you are a male character throughout the game, you actually meet some of these really great uh, female characters and Sadie is one of them. So before I get into this mission of women's suffrage, there was another mission where I got so shocked because I'm running out and everyone's shooting at me. And I'm talking about me as author, of course, now. And then Sadie comes and she's just like stabbing this guy and killing and shooting. And she's a pretty good shot. And uh, she's quite a very proactive female character. And of course, like all... Well, like I've argued, most contemporary heroines, she's not sexualized. She's not, um, how can I say, uh, she's obviously beautiful, but she's really not made to fit these like really Western standards of beauty. She's quite dirty sometimes and uh, she's a cowboy and she's quite reckless and she has this hoarse voice. So I really think she breaks quite a few stereotypes regarding women in video games especially. And of course, she's not any romantic interest to Arthur or anything like that, which I really appreciated. So she's just this really fascinating character that came up from the sides and just kind of blasted her way into the game. And uh, here she is. So... In this mission, you kind of interrupt, you walk into an argument between Sadie, oh, oh, Sadie Adler, that's her surname. I forgot her surname, Sadie Adler. You walk uh, into an argument that Sadie has with Mr. Pearson, who is the chef. And she says that she's got cabin fever because she's stuck at camp all the time. And she says that she can hunt and shoot like men can. So why does she need to get stuck in camp while people like Arthur do all the work of hunting and shooting and killing? When she says, I can also do those things. So, you know, this is a very small event, but women's frustration is kind of voiced here. And she's, I think she takes a very second wave feminist position here, of course, because she says that, I can do everything that men can do, which is the, the position that the second wave feminists took. So she, she is quite unhappy about this. So Arthur, he's like, okay, calm down. So he takes her to Rhodes where they go and purchase some things for the camp. And then she reads Mr. Pearson's letter that he wrote to the person at the, uh, I can't remember to who the letter was. I can't remember if it was to his mom or to some girl. But she's kind of mocking Mr. Pearson like, oh, he's trying to sound so manly, but he's not really. And, you know, she and Arthur kind of laugh about it. So once again, I really enjoyed the conversation that they have on the way there. If you listen closely, these conversations reveal so much about the characters. Right. But then um, at some point, she's giving the grocer a hard time. But you eventually find her back at the wagon and you put the groceries on the wagon. And then you don't get very far until two men on horseback intercept you. They call, they're called the Lemoyne riders, <laughs> raiders. I hope I said that correctly. Um, 
And I think at first, if I remember correctly, Arthur is just like, Sadie, just leave it. And then she's like, oh, no way. So she just starts shooting <laughs> at them. And then she rides off. And then she runs through another with her carriage. And then a proper shootout takes place. So she really doesn't take any nonsense. And again, you know, this mission, uh, this game has this ability to really give you the unexpected. Because... You know, here I'm thinking this is really just a mission where I'm going to pick up some groceries. It's really nothing special. And then on the way back, this huge shootout takes place. And it's this, like, complete chaos. And then you loot them. And it's just this this crazy uh, uh, mission. <laughs> and I'm like, well, you know, where did this happen? How did this... <laughs> How did it escalate so quickly? And then, you know, eventually when you get back at camp, you see that Sadie and, and Arthur have this new mutual respect for each other. They're like, oh, okay, I know you can shoot. I know you can shoot. And um, they have this respect for each other. And then later, like I mentioned, there's another mission where Sadie, you try and kind of your you go out. Um, so, yeah, sorry. Let me just explain this mission carefully. So this is uh, quite a bit later in the game. She, uh, there's, uh, you guys are staying at this house, uh, the camp, I mean, is staying at a house, Arthur and his camp. And then some people come and they shoot at you as usual. <laughs> and then Arthur kind of directs everyone to, you know, escape the house and, or hide. I, I can't quite remember where they go. And then someone's missing and you realize it's Sadie. So Arthur, first of all, he's like, oh my goodness, Sadie is in trouble. So he goes out to try and get Sadie. But then she's there behind the wagon murdering people and really taking care of herself. And then eventually you follow her as she leads the shootout once again. So she's really this cowboy tough type of woman. And I really enjoyed her character quite a lot. And... um I think in some ways she's much more reckless than Arthur, <laughs> uh, much more masculine than Arthur in terms of her character, which is, um, yeah, it's very interesting. I, I really enjoyed the fact that they brought this heroine into the game. Even though you are a male character for the entire game, you encounter this heroine at times and it's very refreshing and it's really fun. And I think her representation is quite positive. And then finally, uh, my last point about Sadie, uh, after they come back from the island mission, which is a total mess, of course, um, they go back to where the camp was and then they don't find anyone there. So they look for them and eventually Arthur finds them. And it turns out that actually Sadie led them out. She led them to their next house. So later and later, her role in the camp becomes quite a bit bigger and at times she actually takes a leadership position which I found so unexpected for a game where I'm a male character like I said about Grand Theft Auto the male characters in those games are so misogynistic and you would never ever expect a female character to have a role like this but then Arthur I really appreciate Arthur I think because he's not this misogynist type of character obviously it depends on what you do with him but at least in the way I, I see it and my experience of the game he he has this respect for Sadie and the game too has this respect for Sadie right so then moving on to the final topic and yeah this just this is something that took place and it just reveals so much about how far we still have to go in terms of misogyny in video games and the video game industry. So like I said, this game takes place when the first wave of feminism started gaining some ground and started becoming more prolific. So there's this one mission where you meet this woman on the street and she's, she's, campaigning for women's votes, right? The right for women to vote. So then I'm not sure if this is, uh, I think it's a side mission, if I remember correctly, but she asks you, can you please uh, drive a few women into town on the back of the wagon? And then Arthur just needs to drive them in 
and then they will do their protest, their protest for women's right to vote as as they drive past. So they kind of sing a chant and Arthur just drives past. And I don't know, it was a very fun mission. <laughs> I really enjoyed that, the way the women talk and... Um, yeah. Again, it makes reference to the beginnings of feminism, the beginning of the first wave, which is the women's suffrage. So, yes, that mission, of course, uh, in and very, maybe not implicit, but more explicit uh, acknowledgement of feminism in the video game, which, like I said, it's uh, very interesting for a game that's led by this male character but who is in himself quite uh, complex too so but then this thing happened and actually I didn't know about this until I did research for this episode today but what some gamers did was that they would make Arthur actually use the suffer the suffragist character as a punching bag <laughs> So apparently on YouTube, when the game came out, many, many videos aired of where gamers would find different ways to go and kill this suffrage woman, this woman that's campaigning for the right to vote. And when I read this, you know, I was so hopeful <laughs> about this episode because I'm like, you know, Red Dead Redemption acknowledges women and feminism and it's really great. But then when I read this, I just felt like, wow, this really reveals a lot about, you know, how far we still have to go. Unfortunately, even though this game tries to include something like this, this suffragist woman just ends up being a punching bag. She she gets mocked and she is killed. <laughs> this is literally, you know, violence against women. I know it's in a video game, but I think it reveals a lot about our current society and still the state <laughs> of feminism. You know, I think many feminists are quite hated and the way that many gamers responded to this video uh, not to this video, to this suffragist character, I think it really reveals a lot about how far the video game industry still has to go. You know, they include these great female characters like Sadie, and we have women leading video games like Lara Croft and Aloy from Horizon Zero Dawn, and I really loved Senua's Sacrifice, and in uh, Alien Isolation, Amanda Ripley. We have all these really wonderful female heroines, but then still, you know, if given the opportunity, <laughs> gamers tend to um, rather beat these feminist characters up and then see how they can uh, kill them <laughs> or destroy them or kill them in gruesome ways. And I think it really just says a lot about misogyny that is still quite prevalent in video games and um, in, in society in general. So, yes, wow, this turned out to be a much longer episode than I anticipated. But that is basically five missions in Red Dead Redemption that I wanted to highlight. And that talks a lot about women and about the environment, too. Now, I haven't finished the game yet. So when I finish the game, I might do another podcast about this uh, because there's obviously quite a few more missions that I still need to do. But I hope you enjoyed this episode that was a bit of a different <laughs> different take of what I usually do. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Please leave some comments for me. And um, please check out the Patreon page if you want some extra perks. And um, yes, thank you so much for listening once again today. And like I said, like I always say, I really hope you enjoyed this episode. And I will see you then again next week. <laughs> Now, I'm not sure what the greeting in Red Dead Redemption is. Maybe something like, uh, howdy, <laughs> but howdy is hello. Um, I'll just say live long and prosper until next week. And then this is the sci-fi feminist driving off into the sunset on her horse. <laughs> Thank you for listening, everyone. Bye-bye. This show is brought to you by Hollow Sweet Media. Computer, list other available Hollow Sweet Media programs. Loading Holosuite Preview Program 4, Random Trek Review, a Star Trek Review Podcast. Okay, yeah, I mean, I think that we've talked about Nurse Chapel before, and I think that, yeah, I mean, it's Majel, right? We we love Majel, which you can't really do wrong, so 
Uh, I think that's that. Well, yes, she can. <laughs> Tried to slip that by you, but maybe not. Maybe not during this era, but she certainly can do. Wrong. Yeah, Christine Chapel couldn't do wrong. Loxwana, uh, yeah, she can definitely spoil some episodes for sure. Loading Holosuite Preview Program Four: The Expanse, an Enterprise podcast. You guys are making some great selling points for Saval, <laughs> but I still don't like him. So. Uh, we're just, we're just gonna have to agree, disagree, and move on, because uh, we have other captains to discuss. Uh, so I'm not gonna go there. Um, but we are now up on our next captain, my favorite captain, um, Captain Cisco. All right, and uh, of course we see him in his opening uh, pilot episode on board the Saratoga and uh, fighting Picard at Wolf 359 when Picard is Lacutus, of course. Which was not an inside job, no matter what anybody says. <laughs> <laughs> Computer, deactivate Holosuite. 